you know, young, young men like Paula. So, yeah, Chris. Um, I'm going to call up um, the, like, everyone who just spoke in that segment to, to come up on stage and, and take questions. Yeah, yeah. So really, the floor is yours. Put up your hand if um, you have questions to ask. Um, okay. Hello. Um, here we go. So, and then yourself and who else had their hand up? Okay, at the back. Hi guys, my name is Katie. Um, my first, I actually have two questions, if that's okay. My first question is for Karim. You were talking about uh, Trump administration, and I wanted to ask: Do you think that if Hillary Clinton became the president, things would be less volatile in Syria or more dangerous? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the last part? I was a thing. <laughs> do you think the situation in Syria would be worse right now if Hillary Clinton won the presidency? No, not really. No. You don't think that no-fly zone would have been a problem? Of course. Um, the the no-fly zone, in my understanding, is the end of the, you know, the Assad camp, so to speak. Um, so far, they, they were able to gain advances because of the, um, the Air Force uh, support. But speaking, of, um, speaking about uh, Hillary Clinton, I, I argue that the problem is systematic. So it's not about Trump or, or Hillary Clinton. As before Trump, Obama uh, suggested that uh, he would liberate and ultimately destroy uh, ISIS, but that didn't happen. And let alone a lot of evidence indicate that uh, the anti-ISIS fight uh, wasn't even genuine. So if, if we can go to later with that. Before that, the Bush uh, administration uh, promised that they can uh, destroy terror by the, the war on terror. And we, we basically forget about that even because it didn't happen and nobody is mentioned. So, um, yeah, my, in my point of view, both Hillary Clinton and, and Trump would not have this um, serious impact in the Syrian conflict the way it should be. Okay, thank you. And my second question is mostly for Marisa, but all of you can answer. And it's in regards to Islamophobia. So, I feel like today um, there's no line to be drawn. You either Islamophobe or you're not. But what about a healthy critique of any political or religious ideology? Like people critique capitalism, communism, Christianity. Shouldn't it be okay to also critique Islam as well? Obviously without being a bully, but shouldn't it be healthy to have a discussion in a free speech society? Yeah, actually. Without being labeled an Islamophobe, as yeah, most people are. Yeah, as long as they. you criticize the political party, uh, that's fine. But when there are instances of using um, the political party as an excuse to criticize Islam as a religion itself, to me that's not really fair. But I think that we are all looking for a gray zone um, uh, beyond the black and white uh, narratives, for sure. Uh, does anybody else want to? <laughs> My, um, also. Hi, my name is Patrick. Two questions, one for Karim, one for Paul. Um, for Karim, thanks for the, the summary you gave about the rise of Salafi <coughs> jihadism <coughs> and um, <coughs> Wahhabism. And you know that the, the media in Indonesia is, is um, you know, liberal Muslim, and they've been fighting radical Islam for a long time in their headlines and their articles. And just wondering, with, and, and what comes up, what used to come up very regularly um, in Indonesia was the notion of Wahhabism, because it's completely foreign to, to liberal Islam. Um, and there are a lot of questions about whether Wahhabism is actually Muslim anyway. Just wondering if, if in the majority Islamic world beyond Southeast Asia, whether that, that's actually a debate. Um, to answer the last question first, whether they are Muslim, I think they are Muslim. So we don't uh, bring ourselves to, to the relevant to the walking around and say you are not Muslim, you are not Muslim. So at the end of the day, uh, Muslim is whoever claims he or she is Muslim. 
But in terms of uh, Wahhabism and Indonesia, which is uh, very recent in Indonesia, as you mentioned, I don't think that the Indonesian case is different from other uh, cases. Um, the Saudi uh, religious institution employed different strategy to uh, spread Wahhabism. One of them, particularly for poor um, states, is through AIDS. But it's, it's very um, restricted to <coughs> accepting Wahhabism in, in France. For instance, when they built the school in, in, in Pakistan, their condition is to teach Wahhabism in the school. Uh, and for uh, when it comes to Indonesia, I believe so. Like recently, um, during the last meeting between Salman uh, bin Abdulaziz and uh, uh, Indonesian president, they also agreed to uh, to I don't know what they what they call it to uh, to support Islamic schools, so to speak, in in Indonesia. That, so that's uh, how the uh, Wahhabi religious institution will take over that whatever. Uh, teaching is about Islamism. But as a, as a contrary to that, I believe all of the, particularly the Sunni world, because they don't, they can't have to do this in, in, in the Shia uh, world, which is very, uh, uh, it is a minority in Russia. I think promotion of uh, uh, traditional Sunnism is very important, like pro uh, promoting an Azhar institution, which is traditionally is, is, is the highest level uh, of, of presentation of Sunnism in the Sunni world. Nowadays, the Saudis are doing the very best to undermine this institution and to bring themselves as a representation of, of Sunnis and therefore the, the true uh, Islam. But I think uh, the best way is to promote this traditional uh, Sunni institutions as a contrary to, to what the Wahhabi institution tries to do. Okay. 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 Well, um, uh, this, is, this, one, this one is to, to call about your, the neo-Ottoman, uh, Erdogan's rise. And you know, the, the rise of Erdogan sort of um, is after all the revelations by Sybil Edmonds. Are you, are you aware of her revelations? No, uh, She was me. an FBI translator and her revelations were she was finally able to speak to Congress and those, those, those revelations were, were transcribed and they're freely available on the internet. But it was basically about, uh, she was a major whistleblower um, in the FBI. And she was employed by the FBI for about six months to a year in 2001 after 9-11. So her revelations were basically about um, retired US military personnel brokering arms deals to the Turks via the American Turkish Council. And there's a tie between Richard Pearl and Douglas Fife, who were advisors to the Turkish ambassador at those times, and also the Israeli ambassadors. So this, the neo-Ottonism neo um, may predate Erdogan. Erdogan is just a part of, of as Grimm was talking about, a systemic, uh, a systematic sort of reforging of the Middle East. It would be interesting to see when the, um, when the documents were released, because it was in 2001, as you said, and his political power came um, to, uh, was established in 2001. So. I'm going to grab that reference off you and, and, and have a look at it because that's, that's something definitely worth exploring. Um, and as I said during my presentation, there, it's a consistent pattern that has happened starting from when uh, Isket Durum, um, or otherwise known today as Hatay province, was taken from Syria and incorporated into the Turkish Republic and then as I said before with Cyprus as well. But there's large gaps in between. It just seems now that under Erdogan it's been really accelerated. So we've seen the acceleration with um, with what's happened with a minor uh, border conflict between Azerbaijan and, and um, Armenia, where where um, Turkey supports uh, the Turkey Kindron in, in Azerbaijan, uh, annexing territory from from the Armenians. We've seen what's happening in northern Syria, northern Iraq. Um, so you know there's large gaps in between you know uh, certain conflicts that Turkey involves itself in, and, and you know sort of. Uh, you know, it takes land, but it's, it just seems that now it's been accelerated because there's just so many events happening in a much shorter period of time. So, um, but I will grab that reference off you. So, appreciate that. Hi. Alright, can you make? Um, this is at Paul as well. Uh, my name is Daniel. Um, in regards to the Kurds, uh, what, what benefit do I have in playing more sides? Wouldn't it be more beneficial to? completely throw the support behind the Assad government 
um, rather than uh, you know potentially uh, aiding <coughs> folks who are against the white uh, the, the white the um, the YPG, yeah. YPG, the PKK, uh, and like as we've seen in that you know photo of the Greater Turkey at Erdogan once, uh, he will definitely not give the Kurds any land. So what what benefit do they have in supporting the rebels? Um, uh, well, they don't really support the rebels, but what what um, what benefit do they have in supporting both sides rather than just trying to support behind the Assad government? So uh, are you here for tonight's session? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Maran Sorsley will get into that in more detail um, about the backmanization of, of Syria. But it's, the Kurds have been very interesting because at first they were anti-government, then sort of Turkey's intervention has kind of pushed them back into, um, you know, not fully coordinating, uh, co coordinating to a certain degree, but not fully collaborating either. So they've got their own agenda, and their own agenda is, is very open that they want federalization of, of Syria. Um, some have called for independence, so it just varies from faction to faction, but the general consensus for now is federalization. Now, uh, Maram will get into greater detail about it, but we've got a minority group, um, about a million and a half that I think she said earlier today, um, wanting about approximately one third of the entire country. And, um, and this part of the country is where much of um, serious gas and oil is, as well as um, its water supplies, you know, dams and, and um, you know, Turkey's got control over the, um, the Euphrates uh, River um, flow into Syria. But um, it, it just seems that the Kurds have an agenda to, to decentralize um, Syria, while generally the government wants to maintain it. Now, when we're talking about the armed militant groups, um, well, the Kurds have, a, or the YPG, I shouldn't say the Kurds, uh, the, the, the YPG faction of the Kurds have um, created the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is a combination of, of non-Syrian government fighters and the Kurdish forces together. And if they're so, you know, they're playing off one another, and it's very fluid. I mean, there's, there's so many contradictions and, and hypocrisies that happen. One time they're, they're, they're aligned with the anti-government forces, then one time they aligned with the government, but you know they chop and change to suit whatever agenda or the agenda that they're pushing for. Um, that's that's how I would respond to that. Um, so just a follow up, just because they claim to like be exclusively fighting ISIS, for example. I spent some time in Syria not long ago, and most of them don't even draw the distinction between moderate rebels supposedly and ISIS. So like, what's the story there? Do they draw a distinction? I think the Kurds in, in Syria, they're, they're very united in supporting the YPG. So we know that there is a minor faction that support the Peshmerga of, of northern Iraq. However, the Syrian Peshmerga aren't even in Syria now. They're, they're located in, in, in um, near where the Yazidis are in, in northwestern um, uh, Iraq. So, so they're very, the Kurds are generally very united behind the YPG. As for what you said about um, about Syrian people in general not distinguishing between different terrorist groups. Um, I haven't been to Syria yet, I'm hoping to be there later this year, but for the people that I have spoken to that have been to Syria, it's, a, it's effectively what you just told me, they don't make a distinction, and, and I'm sure Jay or, or Dr. Tim Anderson um, will be able to uh, uh, explain that in, in better detail than I can, because I don't have that first-hand experience. So, I can just draw off what, what I've been told from, from other people that have been to Syria. And it's effectively what you said. Um, they don't make these distinctions. Uh, for them, it's the same ideology. Um, you know, whether it's al Nusra, whether it's ISIS, whether it's uh, supposed moderate factions that, that are aligned with al Nusra anyway. Um, yeah, for them, it's just one and the same. Thanks, man. Okay, um, I've got a two-prong question for uh, Paul. You're, you're quite popular today, Paul. Um, so the first part of the question is regarding the photos you showed from Gerablus. Now, um, in Turkish, the C is actually not pronounced as a K. It's actually pronounced as a J. So Thanks for the question. It wasn't Gerablus. Yeah. It's actually Gerablus in Turkish. So my question was regarding the fact that you have such a heavy presence of Turkish national symbols and, and such a an outward expression of, of Turkism. Is that because the population of Gerablus, and I am completely <coughs> ignorant here, 
Do Turkmen make up a significant portion of the population of Gerardus? Yes, they do. However, there is still a very substantial Arab population. Now, because of Syria's uh, not conducting censuses, it's, it's very difficult to de uh, determine exactly the demographics of certain areas. But in Jarablus, there's definitely a uh, Turkmen minority. However, there's also very significant um, Arab. Uh, I don't know whether it's minority or majority, but the two communities do exist in this one particular town. Yeah. So, I mean, this isn't the second part of my question yet. How has there been any indication of how local Arabs feel regarding this kind of outward expression of Turkishness? Yes, there, there has been, and it's been consistent whether it's in northern Aleppo countryside where, where Jarablus is, or whether it's on the countryside of Idlib, which also borders Turkey. Um, ju just to get into Idlib, for example, just a month ago there was um, Turkish intervention uh, where, where they, where they uh, demolished farms of, of Syrians, and then they built a new border wall that penetrated quite deeply in, into Syria. And, there was vast amounts of protests against this move. Um, and we've got to remember that Idlib is, is a uh, militant-controlled uh, part of Syria. So it's not a government-controlled area of Syria. So even the local Syrians there, uh, it was about a month ago, they were protesting quite heavily against this um, incursion or you know shifting of the borders. When it comes to Aleppo and Jarablus, there has been a lot of complaints from free Syrian army factions themselves making statements against um, against the Turkish uh, military. So although they were aligned to remove ISIS from this border region, now cracks are beginning to emerge where, where certain Free Syrian Army factions are openly speaking out against the Turkish, uh, heavy Turkish uh, influence in, in, in the town's um, sort of uh, administration. So sort of biting the hand that feeds them. Exactly, and it's been a consistent theme throughout this war. So the second part of my question relates to the map of the Greater Turkey that you uh, that you put up, and it's interesting because first, first and foremost, no part of Cyprus is in there. Uh, Azerbaijan and even Iranian Azerbaijan are not in there, and even the former territories of the Ottoman Empire really aren't in there. It's only parts of northern Iraq and northern Syria where you have large concentrations or you know, scattered groups of, of Turkmen communities. So the second part of my question is, is Erdogan encasing a neo-pan-Turkism as neo-Ottomanism in order to gain local support from uh, people nostalgic for the Ottoman period and the Ottoman Caliphate in order to create a new Lebensraum for the Anatolian Turks? So it's, it's quite interesting. I've put in my PhD proposal and hopefully it gets accepted. And what I, I'll be explore, hopefully I'll be exploring a Ottomanism. And what I contend as well is that, that this policy is also, is, there's also a sub um, component to it, which is pan -Turco, the pan -Turcoism. So as I said during my presentation, it's more of a nostalgia of when a Turkey people well, as a collective were great. And, as I highlighted, it didn't include Central Asia. Um, however, uh, Turkey are making a great push into the resource-rich Turkic um, areas of, of Central Asia. So there's definitely that component. With the map that I that I posted, you're correct, it didn't include Cyprus, which is very, very interesting. It did include parts of Bulgaria and Greece, however. It did include a part of Azerbaijan, but that's the part that is detached from Azerbaijan proper. Um, I forgot the name of the region. Yes, thank you. Um, they, they did include that. They surprisingly, they didn't include the rest of Armenia, but I think that would be a little bit too controversial. But anyway, who, who knows? It's, it's a controversial regime in Ankara. Um, so I, I do agree with you. It, it, it is, I, or I contend that there is a component of pan turkism in, in, in uh, the AKPs or Erdogan's um, sort of ideology. Okay, so um, I, I do realise that there were questions down there, but um, I wanted to hand it over to someone who hasn't yet asked a question. Uh, so, um, hello, uh, my question is for Karim. So, I heard one explanation of the causes of Saudi Arabian imperialism as uh, because it's such an oil-based economy that now with the changes in you know environmentalism they realized that this might be one of the last generations where they get to 
sell oil at rates of power. And so now they're pushing into different sorts of foreign policy interventions. Um, is this why they are perhaps harnessing religion, uh, harnessing Wahhabism to cover up for a political agenda that runs much, much deeper? Is this uh, environmentalism part of what's fueling their foreign policy aggression? In terms of foreign policy aggression, I don't think that the Saudi Arabia is doing anything recent or anything new. It's just um, I, compa I, I compare the Afghan case with the, with the Syrian case, which uh, was very similar. Um, <clears throat> before that, you can see the, the U.S.-Saudi um, alliance, which was part of uh, the anti-communism, uh, uh, so to speak. Um, but in terms of um, this can be the last generation uh, get benefit of, of the uh, oil resources. I, I think they are aware of that. But and and the, the new rhetoric is um, we have to diversify the economy and do the things like this. And they move toward the more liberal economy where uh, a lot of subsidies was was lifted from many things, including petrol and uh, uh, bread. Uh, but but that I, I don't view that as part of uh, um, economic reform. I think they are in trouble uh, because of uh, the reduction in oil price. Uh, they are struggling with uh, many economic challenges, and they involve themselves into too much expanding in terms of wars. One part in, in Yemen, one part in Syria, and uh, they are also involved in Iraq. So. They need high, high expenditure on, on, uh, on all of these uh, wars. And uh, at the end of the day, the average Saudi citizen, I think, is paying the bill. Uh, in terms of the environment, uh, I'm not sure how Saudi policy is relevant to any, any sorts of environment policies. So is it that Saudi Arabia is actually a country fueled by religious extremism, or is it that they are harnessing this extremism for a political agenda that runs I, yeah. uh, If I understood you correctly, I think it's part of the state. The religious institution is part of the state from the first place. We are talking about a country which was established in 1932. Witness no <coughs> uh, military coup, witness no revolution. All of these modern discourses such as nationalism, socialism, uh, uh, democracy, and so on, <coughs> are signs of heresy there. So the state it built based on this agreement between the Wahhabi uh, institution and the, uh, the state itself, the rulers. Um, so in, in that sense, it's, it's completely part of, of the state. And when they, they expand Wahhabism worldwide, they want, they want influence through that uh, uh, propagation and institution. Like they, they want people uh, in, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and elsewhere. Where, where they can have political influence there. Yeah, to their um, main country. Uh, no, yeah. Uh, are you going to let me ask a question? Well, I mean, I because you have pointed to me before. Yeah, I have. You're right. You're right. There's quite a few different things up. I figure I've forgotten some of the order, but I want to pass it over to those who haven't yet. Well, I haven't asked a question. Okay. You can ask the question. No, um, no, I, I said no. I do apologize. I recognize that a lot of hands went up. Okay, so I have two questions actually. One for Paul and one for Paula. Um, so I actually, Paul, I actually found your presentation very interesting because I had no knowledge of um, Turkey's implication in Syria. So I'm sorry if my question sounds a bit naive, but um, <laughs> you were talking about um, the way um, the AKP has this very um, nostalgia of the Ottoman Empire and so on. What's the, the opinion of the general population in Turkey? Do they have this nostalgia as well? And how, what, how do they feel about the way the country is involved in the Syrian conflict? I haven't been to Turkey yet, and I really hate talking on behalf of other people that don't belong to my culture or whatnot. Um, so from my limited understanding, um, 
those on the coastal areas, those that live on the coastal cities, which which are you know the, the largest city, constant, uh, it, uh, Istanbul, and the third largest city is me. Um, uh, they're both coastal cities, and if we can use the referendum that happened two days ago as a reflection, um, it's all the major cities, especially coastal cities, that are very much against um, what's happening in Syria and very much against their, their president. When we look uh, into the interior of Turkey, um, where it's not as urbanised, um, but you know, it's not like Australia, it's not an urbanised country as much as Australia, most of the people uh, generally agree you know, with their president and um, they feel that they've got an obligation to, to uh, intervene in Syria. Um, so it, it, it's very, you know, there's also this, this um, distinction in Turkey between the rural, uh, the rural population and the urbanised population. So it just depends uh, from place to place. But as I said, if the referendum is anything to go by, it's a very even split. I think from memory, um, it was about 51% or 51.5% that voted um, yes to, to bring the president greater powers. Um, so it's, it's very, there's a very clear division. Thank you. And sorry, my second question was for Paula. Um, first, I want to congratulate you. I nearly cried, actually. <laughs> You're really talented. Um, and uh, so you were saying that uh, creativity is a luxury. Um, safe. Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to say though that we've had really great examples of creativity blossoming, you know, during crisis. So I was actually wondering if you are aware of any um, artists, Syrian artists, uh, writing on the Syrian conflict, uh, can, or writing, or you know, painting, or if there's if there's been any um, artistic movements getting out of the conflict. Um, I'm sure there is. Um, none that I'm aware of. The only ones that I'm aware of are people who've left. Um, I'm not aware of any art coming directly out of Syria. There probably is. I'm just. Do you have anyone that you can recommend that have that have left? I'll I'll speak to you after. Okay, no worries. <laughs> okay. So, so just um, just might have just in the immediate um, sense we have three more questions. So um, there's. This gentleman here, there's a gentleman at the back, and there's a gentleman there. So I did promise it to the gentleman at the back, and then to the gentleman. Here. Hello, my, my name is Gabriel. I'd just like to direct to uh, Paul and uh, do a correction regarding the uh, Armenian and Syrian genocide uh, feeding. You can you just push the. Uh, yeah. Uh, regarding the, uh, the figures of the Assyrian Armenian genocide, you uh, said the reverse of uh, what's the correct uh, real, uh, figures. Assyrian uh, figures is 750,000. The uh, Greek context was 300 to 500,000. Okay, um, thanks for clarifying that for me. Yeah, I, I do apologize. So the next question is up the front. Oh, I already said the Okay, uh, um, this question is for the gentleman in the blue shirt whose name I cannot remember. Okay, okay. okay. so um, I uh, just want to say that I, um, I uh, am now 47 and I was around when the Afghan Jihad was in a big way and being spread, its messages were spread throughout Australia. And I recall that uh, it wasn't just Saudi Arabia and Sunni groups that was promoting the jihad. It was also Iran. Um, the uh, Iranian, uh, the the uh, Jamiat uh, al-Islami, uh, which is, uh, is whose leader, the spokesman, began. Well, I'm talking about the. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about the Jamiat al-Islami. Okay, uh, was. Uh, you know, uh, unlike the Hizb Islami, uh, was very much um, uh, promoting Sunni Shia unity, as was the official uh, whatever of the policy of the Iranian government at the time. Um, but also, I think we need to recognise that a lot of 
the Islamism, and particularly the violent Islamism, <coughs> a lot of that also came out of Iran, particularly the cult of the, uh, of the martyr, uh, which was very, uh, you know, the, 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 the martyrdom cult that existed during the Iran-Iraq war, where young Iranian men were sent out uh, to walk across minefields. This was all uh, well known. And also, uh, we must understand that a lot of the Sunni groups who supported uh, suicide bombing gained their theology from groups like Hezbollah, uh, which also promoted uh, this kind of uh, activity. What uh, uh, Suicide bombing. Hezbollah promotes suicide bombing? Yes, they were. That's incorrect. Yes, they were entirely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, well, well, Hamas got its, its theology for suicide bombing directly. From there is one case of, of suicide bombing contributed to Hezbollah when uh, when the uh, Marines in, in 1982 or maybe slightly yeah. before even that, that even, was. Even that not it's not proven. Uh, yeah. it's that's why I said attributed. Yeah. It's yeah. an alleged thing. Uh, only that case, except that there is no suicide bombing. But certainly the idea of committing suicide. No, they for, in, in the Shia correspondent that's clearly forbidden as it is. Well, it's in, also forbidden in the Sunni. In Quran, that's what I'm saying. But I'm saying that a lot of the political side. But it's not for, forbidden by the uh, jihadist either. Yeah. But I'm saying that I don't think you can claim that the. And I'm not trying to make a sectarian comment. No, no, I'm just saying that, that, you know, it's something that I certainly recall. Uh, uh, from from those days, from the early 80s, uh, that there was a very strong uh, sense of uh, violent Islamism uh, from the Iranian side, as well as from the the uh, uh, Salafist jihad side. Ecumenical uh, jihad. You, you mix it. You, you mix it all up, you man. You mix it all up. There's 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 this difference between the war between Iraq and, and Iran, that's, that's and not it. And the, uh, the Afghanistan uh, situation. But, but what I'm saying is that, is that the Iranians were heavily involved in fighting the Soviets. I, I, can, I can give, yeah, give explanation yeah. how they were involved. They were. Yeah. But if that's, a, if that's a question, can I comment on that? If you wish, but that, that's, 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 that's what I... That's what I uh, you know, that's what I, that's what I recall. Yeah, just just briefly commenting on that. Yes, it, Iran was involved in that in, in post 1989, which the Soviets were already withdrawn, and that was question of whether uh, uh, the Taliban and then the, the allies of uh get into power, and Iran Iran heavily involved first by supporting the Shia Hazara, the the uh, Baghdad party. And then after that, they understood that this is not enough, enough so they take the strategy of supporting all Persian-speaking uh, parties. Just to, uh, and their official policy was to support the central government in, in Afghanistan, and their strategy was to stop the, uh, the expansion of, of Taliban, which they failed. So in that sense, if any, any violence happened, I, I think... So the Iranian government supports the communist regime in Afghanistan? They may, I think. They, they support everyone, including yeah, the communist uh, parties. If, if you call uh, Rashid Dostum a communist, they were supporting him just to stop the expansion of power. I think we should move on to the next question. I um, totally understand where the fund is coming from. Personally, I've studied this as well. Um, from what I know, the Iranians did support Hezbi Wahdat against the, uh, the Afghan government and its Soviet backers. But moving on to something Syria related, next question. <coughs> okay, hello everybody. Okay, my have three questions actually. <laughs> One question. Okay, actually it's two. Okay, I have one question for Karim. It's about what you what you predicted will happen to tensions between Sunni and Shia after the battle of Mosul. And another question, the same question, sorry, for. Oh, what do you predict it will happen to the nation between Kurdish and Arab after the war of Afghanistan? Um, yeah, to start from my question, um, I think the situation in Iraq is, is so tense. It's basically, also I agree with uh, Marisa that uh, 
it's not uh, sectarianism there, like Sunni versus Shia, and it's, it's very difficult to know who is Shia and who is Sunni when, when you look at evidence on the, on the ground. However, the Iraqi situation is, is much uh, bigger than this. I mean, we talk about one of the ten most corrupt governments in the world, statistically, and um, that's even a post-occupation government dealing with the all kind of uh, carriers there and distracted the um, infrastructure. So it's, it's not um, any any government in that position would be cut. Um, just like in Afghanistan, currently. Yeah. So we are speaking about the failed state here. In that situation, after the fall of Muslim, um, I think the the, the Iraqis well, not the, after liberating Muslim, it was fall on, under ISIS. But the Iraqis is, is this really unity and consolidation between all their, uh, their uh, the component of their society, um, which it is challenging. Even now, uh, after the, the liberation of Muslim, you have like, this huge destroyed city. You know, just like Fallujah. I mean, Fallujah after 2004, 70 percent of the city was destroyed, and then more than 70 was destroyed uh, in, in after invasions. So uh, the, the the problem of, of Iraq is, is bigger than uh, than uh, what it seems uh, on the surface, and I think that is going to come even after Mosul and after ISIS to hunt the whole Iraqi society. So I'm kind of <laughs> pessimist in this. Uh, just for those who aren't familiar with Syria, they've got a very frustrating system where they tend to name the capital city after the province, or maybe it's the other way around, I'm not too sure. So when we talk about Aleppo, you know, sometimes you'll hear people saying Aleppo countryside, they're talking about the province of Aleppo, and then obviously there's a city. When we're talking about Raqqa, um, you know, there's, there's a city of Raqqa, and then there's the province of Raqqa. Um, currently, the, the, the YPG, or you know, the, the more broad term of the Syrian uh, Democratic Forces, which is mostly comprised of the Kurdish fighters and then a few Arab tribes as well, or a few Arab militias as well, um, they're currently engaged in fighting ISIS in Raqqa province. However, they've made it very, very clear that, that they don't really have an interest in taking the city. Sometimes they've made reference that they will, sometimes they won't. And their main <coughs> issue for the predominantly Kurdish fighters is that Raqqa is staunchly an Arab city. It, there's, there's virtually no Kurds there. It's, it's very, very Arab. Um, what will happen afterwards is that, well, the Syrian army are nowhere near Raqqa city at the moment. They're too preoccupied in fighting ISIS in eastern Aleppo countryside, which borders Raqqa. But there's still a long way to go before they, they enter that province. Um, and they're too busy fighting ISIS in Homs province, which also borders uh, Raqqa province. So there's, there's, there's going to be a huge amount of time before they even reach Raqqa. So um, when it comes to taking the city, um, perhaps the Syrian Democratic Forces, which as I said are predominantly Kurdish, they may uh, take it. Um, it's too hard to tell. And even if they do take it, I think they'll push it so that it's under um, Arab uh, control, or at least those allied uh, to them. Um, but as, as Madame said earlier today, um, uh, she, she took a quote from President Assad who said that, you know, the war won't end till we take every inch of Syria. And I think when he means that, it's not just taking it from al Nusra or from ISIS or from any other jihadi group, it's also from taking it um, from anyone who, who wants to create a separation or a federalised state or, you know, an independent state. And, um, I think we can assume, although he hasn't said it directly, we can assume that that would also include the Kurds, um, whether they're pushing for federalization or an independent state within Syria. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, with the president of the country making a statement like that to take back every inch, um, I think Raqqa, you know, the situation in Raqqa will just, it will eventually come under Syrian government control again. Okay, so, um, no, I, um, I wanted to just say we have time for just one more question. If you have not put your hand up to ask a question before, okay, the gentleman over there has been uh, putting his hand up for a while. Thank you. Uh, Bernie Shara, um, I'm just curious as to why um, I hear the, the term used in this room the Assad regime mm. is, is a loaded term. Yeah. 
demonising both Assad and the Syrian government. Why are we using it today? I'd, I'd like to, uh, I'll pass it on yeah. to you after. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the most important distinction and why we have to call it a government is that we need to remember that in 2014 there was elections and in those elections Bashar Assad won by 88%. Um, most importantly is that 88%. 88 and you know people can say that you know it wasn't fair elections and you know etc et it's the same rhetoric it's the same rhetoric that we hear from the west um, that it's not legitimate etc the distinctions that we need to note with these particular events or sorry elections um, is that it was it was um, under the um, supervision of lawmakers from a variety of neutral countries such as India, uh, Brazil, Nicaragua, if I remember correctly, um, Uganda. So if people in the West want to say that that you know, and sorry, may I say that these lawmakers came out and said that there were three open, transparent elections. Now, if we can't take the words of these lawmakers from these post-colonial states, um, I would argue that you know it's just. It is. It is imperialism, just you know, and and you know, sort of racism. Um, definitely, if if they can't, if if they don't feel that people from post-colonial states are capable of supervising elections. And 2004, since 2004, has there been an election? Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying 2014, 2014. three years ago, or two and a half years ago. Moving on, um, as well as that, you know, I said it's, it's, it had a participation, uh, sorry, 88% of people voted for Assad, but the clear distinction that we need to make is that sure, the, the you know, huge chunks of the population weren't able to make elections, however, um, it still had a higher participation rate than the last two US elections per capita. So we had more Syrians than... than So this is why we've got to be very careful when, when people want to say Syrian regime and you know it's 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 fair to say that, that we can call it a Syrian government. One million one million Syrian refugees. One million Syrian refugees in Lebanon voted for Assad. I think there is um, a bit of confusion when we define things going on in Syria. Even when we use the word revolution, it's highly contested. Uh, what is this? Is this, this a civil war? Um, but why I think why I use regime is uh, because I rely on the Arabic term, uh, Nizam, and uh, that's how even Syrian people tend to call uh, the Syrian government. <coughs> so to me, it's a pretty neutral term which doesn't. Uh, have uh, that negative uh, meaning. Okay. Um, um, I, I use uh, the term Assad regime a lot, particularly in this presentation, and I totally agree with the gentleman at the back. It's a, it's a negative term, it has negative implications, and um, the, real, the, the right term is the Syrian government, actually, and that's the only uh, legitimate government so far, and the caliphate so far is not yet established. So, so that's the only uh, legitimate government in reality and in theory. No. I, I did that too, but I didn't need to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Unfortunately, I can't get to absolutely everyone, and I did say that I, I would give it to those who haven't yet asked questions yet. This gentleman has been, has been asking for the mic for a while. My name is Jafar, I'm from South Lebanon, which is the main source of Hezbollah, which um, recognized as a terrorism organization. Um, first, I have to ask a question. Um, after this conference, which, you know, um, discuss the issue of Syria, and we want to know what is the truth, whether who is right and who is wrong. I'm wondering, after this conference, even if we know who is right and who is wrong, can we change the policy of Australian government, uh, which support some organization, or support the, um, the United States of attacking um, Syria? So that's the main issue, because if we don't do anything, um, our knowledge will not going to give any benefit. doesn't matter if we know the right or wrong. 
Um, I think you should have alternative to this conference in the end to put a plan to put a plan what we can do with the truth. Um, actually, um, from my experience in, in Lebanon, I live I live the civil war which goes for a long time in Lebanon, and I leave the invasion of Israel to South Lebanon. Who is Hezbollah? Some people does not know who is Hezbollah. I am from, as I tell you in the beginning, I am from Nabati, which the main area of Hezbollah. Hezbollah is the only the people who live in, over there in South Lebanon. It's the population, like me, like every citizen living there. And they practice the invasion of Israel to South Lebanon. And when the Israeli goes to Lebanon um, to fight the Palestinians, um, the Shia, which the most of the population in South Lebanon, which I call them now Hezbollah, is, that's the majority of people who live in South Lebanon in the border of, from the border of Israel until about maybe 45 kilometers or 50 kilometers until um, a city called Saigon. So all the people was um, a peaceful people living there does not have um, gun. Only they support was supporting the Palestinians because they considered what are supporting the um, the Palestinian by um, demonstration with them saying um, we are with the right of the Palestinian to take their land. Um, that's why you know um, the Lebanese people was very peaceful people does not have any gun or anything. When the Israeli coming and making a lot of bad things, you know, in South Lebanon. And then they find themselves, they find themselves they should defend themselves. In that time was the revolution of, of Imam Khomeini in Iran. And because there is a common culture between Shia and Iran and Shia and Lebanon, they find support. That support by, you know, um, the Muslim, like, um, for the humanity support, because Khomeini say he's, uh, he's gonna um, help the humanity in everywhere against the arrogant, he was, you know, um, he was rising, rising, um, saying something. I am with the uh, poor against all the arrogant in all the world. Sorry, I. Uh, yeah. Only so because we're now, running out now, of time. Just, you know, I'm telling you, um, the war in Syria from the Lebanon, there is a disease. Since Saiki Spiko, since Saiki Spiko, they built the government, the French and English, they built the system, the political system in Lebanon, in balance of religion. Like they give the money, you know, um, extra power because there is a shared culture between the French and the Christianity, because there is a Christianity. They give the Shia the parliament, they give the Sunni um, the um, minister. And after when the Palestinians come in, um, they have the worry of increasing the power of the Muslims. Then they create the war for um, those for 30 years. This disease in Lebanon, which was successful in preventing the people to make an, um, a good government, to make the people a democratic country, really, a, I mean democracy, not a religious you know, a system. Because of successful that system, they want to move it to Syria and build the Syrian, um, this system in Syria, they, they want to build this system in Iraq, they want to build this system to divide the people and using, using the religious, to fight the people with each other. I'm wondering why in Libya there is a Sunni in Libya, okay, is still fighting there. What is the Kurdish and Turkish? They're all Sunni, both of them. So um, the war is not a religious. The war is only um is only you know, for the power, for the money, for the people who live in the creation to increase their recreation and they use the religious um, for their um own plan. That's all. Thank you. Oh, oh, I'll answer the question that you brought up. Um, <laughs> by the way, my dear friend Marwa took me to South Lebanon, great place, especially around the Resistance Museum in Nita. But you asked at the beginning what we can do to cha help change Australian foreign uh, policy towards Syria. Um, there's two parts. The first part is that we're all here, despite all the negative media uh, campaign against um, some people in this room. Um, <laughs> so the first point is that we're all here, um, despite the, the, the intense media um, campaign against people like myself, Jay, Tim, um, me, me, uh, Mar um, Maram's been under the spotlight for several years. And the second point, um, what we can do to help pressure the Australian government, I'll pass on to Jay. So on the 23rd of March, uh, which I believe is a Sunday, um, 23rd of April. 
23rd of April, uh, we do have a, um, a rally, um, and uh, you can find out more about that on, on Tim's wall or my wall. Um, it's going to be at Town Hall, I believe. Yeah, I haven't had a look at the pamphlet yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, the message is basically Australia hands off Syria, hands off the region. And so that, I guess, answers that question. What time? What time? The time is... Because I haven't been directly involved in organising this Yes, and the other thing is uh, the, the economic sanctions that have been imposed on Syria. So we have to find creative ways of letting people know that if they want to help the Syrian people, the easiest way is to tell the government to lift the sanctions that are driving up the price of everything, including food and medicine. And we could form a group of moderate rebels and we get married. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, um, that's, that's all we have. Um, thank you very much. I, I sincerely apologise. I, I sincerely apologise to everyone who wanted to ask a question but didn't, but didn't. And as I said towards the end, I tried to uh, emphasise giving the mic to those who hadn't yet asked or who weren't presented. Um, <laughs>